In the studio with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, who, by the way, I would point out, remained the highest ranking officer in the studio because I think you, you do outrank the general, do you not, Bill? Yeah, he, <laughs> yeah, he, he's, he's, he's a one star, I was a two star. And, and you know that was very mature of you to not point that out. No, I would you, never point that you, you out. Did, That's not my style. You didn't try to reign over in dominance that <laughs> I way. I would not. And the only reason I mention is because you you asked me. You brought about, it up. I, I you brought it up. Wrong. Wrong. You, yeah, you would never. I, I I'd never. Know. I'd never mention. You're a modest man, Bill. Well, yeah, and I think there's too much uh, emphasis put on the the number of stars, the number of stripes you have. Uh, it's how you do your job. I would concur. Yeah. yeah, and Maria Lawrence in here as well. Maria, good morning. Happy to be back. Uh, the by the way, great to have you back. <laughs> right uh, in that Republican second congressional district, along with the general, you've got of course Riley Moore, uh, Nate Kane, who will be uh, on our program as well. Uh, I'll check my calendar here. I think he's on Thursday. Yeah, Nate will be on Thursday at eight. Uh, Alex Gasserud, who we've had on uh, a couple of different times, and Alex shows up in our chat room every now and then. Um, also uh, in there is Joe Early. We've not been con- He's out of Bridgeport. I've not been contacted by Joe, so we've not talked to Joe. And also on the Democratic uh, ticket out of there is Steve Wendelin, who is uh, listed as being out of Wardensville okay. and Lost River. So th- that's the yeah. field there. And, and I made the statement that, uh, you know, basically the election is in the Republican primary. Obviously, there's a Democratic opponent, but in West Virginia, the race is really in the primary. It, it is, and I think you're probably right, but I think the governor's race is going to be interesting. Steve Williams is a very formal candidate. Whether he can uh, formal enough to win, probably not, but nevertheless, he's going to make people realize that they've been in the race. He's got an impressive resume. Yeah, and it's a it's a bloodbath there on the other side of the, the well, that's a good governor point. race. They're, they're gonna, yeah. the, the Treasury will be thinned out on the Republican side <laughs> yeah. in the primary, you would, you would think. The... Uh, Next guest on our program is the superintendent of schools in Berkeley County, Ron Stevens. Ronald, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Maria, it's good to have you back in the chair. Thank you. Good to be here, Ron. I was hoping you were going to be here because I'm on the high chair today, and you would be on the on the other side, which would be the low chair, but because you're kind of a big guy, you'd still be on the high yeah. chair. So. There you yeah, go. yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we are in, uh, you know, it's staffing and budget season. Amen. And uh, March is a huge uh, month for that here in Berkeley County Schools. And you know, we're in the middle of our staffing meetings. And uh, I uh, needed to squeeze a few minutes out so I could talk with you guys. We appreciate you doing that, uh, Ron. In regards to budgeting meetings, uh, the state legislature is in flux in regards to some clawback money that dealt with education and the amount of money the legislature spent. Uh, I get disagreement when I ask as to whether or not this filters to the local level and the county level with expenditures. Do you have any clarity on that yourself at the Berkeley County level, Ron? You know, we have... We have followed the guidance that's been provided to us, and all the federal funds that that we have spent are tracked in their own unique project codes. Um, We've been audited by an independent CPA firm, and we've had no findings, uh, you know, other than we we had one finding uh, during our, um, you know, when the pandemic was just uh, starting and the COVID, um, the uh, vaccinations were, were beginning, and we were working with uh, state and county officials to organize um, um, a vaccination clinic. Um, we utilized $300 to, uh, to pay the workers by paying for their food. Um, we immediately found out that that was not permitted, that we couldn't, we couldn't use the money for that. And we, re, we Berkeley County, um, paid that money back. That was the only finding that, that we have had during this entire time. And like I said, everything else is, um, um, is, is tracked with unique project codes. So all of our money is accounted for. We've not had any additional uh, information from the, from the federal side of things, um, you know, about any of the money. But we're on pace to spend uh, our remaining funds on educational services uh, as we run through one last summer of summer school. The House yesterday passed a budget that was just under $5 billion, 
And there's agreement that they'll have to come back in May around, I guess it's toward the end of the third week with an interim session where they suspect the governor will call a special session. And then they'll further address the back end of the budget once they figure out how this near half billion dollars is uh, going to be treated by the federal government. Does that affect how you can financially plan the next year, Ron? Um. It, it it always does uh, because, you know, we want to make sure that as we budget, we, we keep a, um, um, you know, a certain percentage available in our general funds to cover expenses um, that, you know, come up that you're that we're unaware of. And in case we have emergencies, uh, I think this year we're planning to keep a little uh, an extra percent or so set aside. But again, we have uh, we are able to account for everything and spend it accordingly, and it's my understanding that you know that those rollback funds are for um, areas that that are not able to account for how they were that they were spent. Um, the difficulty about that was in the very beginning, you know, everybody was in a rush to get this money out there to help right away, and there were, and the, it was kind of like uh, building the airplane while you're in the air. <laughs> type yeah. of approach. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were they were making all this money available, and you know on a on a monthly basis there was um, changes in what had to be done and how it could be spent, um, and and some people were a little slow to react to that. Yeah, we it's awfully easy to look back in hindsight and criticize, but I think you're exactly right. We were spending money like building an airplane in flight, but we had to do it. There was a, we had a major crisis on our hands and action had to been taken. If we'd wait to have everything in place before the money was spent, then there were, it would have been much worse than what we have. So again, uh, there are criticism to be had, but I think we kind of piling on too late. Let me ask a question going back to this $465 million. I've heard it described in two different ways. One is a clawback, which means the money would go back to D.C. The other way is redirection, which would be uh, we had the money would remain in place, but it would be redirected for specific purposes. If it is redirection, do you have any idea how long it, that you would have for the money to be obligated or spent uh, we've not been given that information yet um you know to my knowledge uh, unless something is happening right now um I've, I've not been contacted or spoken to about how that will that would take place and i guess uh, it's a little premature i don't think uh, uh the legislators really understand and probably the fed go- uh, feds do not know either so uh so i hope it's a redirection as opposed to a the clawback approach. Yes, I, I, you know, I, I would hate to see the school systems over the, um, not actually, it's not just the school systems, the state in general and all of the uh, efforts uh, to see it's uh, our communities through the, the pandemic uh, were utilizing this money. And unfortunately, there's people out there that in, you know, in any type of circumstances, there's people that are going to misuse and, 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 um, and misguide um, good intention people. So I, I think that that may be some of the root of it. They're finding uh, organizations that were, um, you know, squirreling away the money, so to speak, or or using it for areas that, you know, really weren't in benefit of what it was intended for. Uh, again, fortunately here we we have an independent audit regularly, and we're making sure that as the money came in for us, we were spending it on approved um, areas. So I feel good about where Berkeley County Schools stands, um, but, you know, other school systems and other areas around the state, I'm, I'm not privy to how they spent their money. Within the school systems themselves, uh, the old question is, with Harry Truman, the buck stops here. Does the buck buck stop with you as a superintendent? A buck stop with the state board of education, or the buck stop with the uh, uh, with the local school board, or is it a combination thereof? I've never been in my own mind clear how this is right. all sorted out. Well, it's a combination of all of that, and you you know you hit that you kind of hit it on the head there with that last one, and it depends on the pool of money that we're talking about and what the money. Sometimes you get money and it's designated to be spent on a certain. Uh, a certain topic or, or or in a certain avenue uh, and sometimes you get money that 
you know, you put in your in your general fund, and then the local resources can determine where it goes. So, you know, we have uh, the state fund formula, which tells us how some of that money is is going to be directed. We have federal funds, which tells us what the money has to be spent on, um, and then we have levy funds and and some other things that uh, gives the the local. Uh, school board and local personnel such as myself and, uh, and our senior staff the opportunity to determine what we need so there, there is there truly is a different uh, a few different pails of money to pull from so so Ron speaking of the money pails um, are you I heard an ad this morning about actually from the AFT um, I believe it might have been the AFT AFL-CIO, um, advocating folks to call their local legislators about teacher pay raises, specifically teacher service staff. Um, are you in conversation with the local delegation about the pay raise? Are you confident in that? Um, are you even having conversations? Well, I have in our in our superintendents group and and with uh, the the team here at Berkeley County, we have talked about how we would approach that if we were contacted. I, I have not been contacted directly by anyone from AFT um, or uh, um, the uh, any of our state legislators on that particular topic at this time. Ron, there are a couple of bills that the House has passed. Uh, I'm not sure how they're getting through the Senate at this time. I think uh, one's maybe more likely to pass than the other, but I'm not certain at this point. One has to do with the bill which would eliminate the requirement for the Board of Education uh, representatives to sign off on a work permit for uh, kids in uh, high school trying to get a job, I think, down to the age of 14 or 15. And the other one is a bill which would allow kids in their in-sport season at the high school level to also play the club sport associated with that at the same time. Your thoughts on those bills, and if you would first start with the work permit bill. Um, well, you know, the work permit bill, if you look at, at, at history, the work permit bill um, is basically designed to give uh, parents back um, you know some some power over what they can determine their their children can and cannot do. Um, we like to think that they had that power anyway, and were we were working with them in the best interest of the students. Um, you know, there's pros and cons to the work permit bill. Uh, you know, the pros are it really does give a lot of freedom to um, to 14 and 15 year olds to work with their parents uh, to be able to go out and find. Uh, a job, and um, you know, if the parents um, sign off on on things and provide their uh, their age certificates, then it's my understanding that that's all that would be needed. Um, you know, so I, I think that that is a good thing as a parent. I I would like to have that. I would expect to have that uh, control and responsibility for my children. You know the the con to that is there's a there's a number of people that are unprepared to make those educated types of decisions as to what's in the best interest of their of their children, um, and it really takes the um, the um, in loco parentis part of of laws about education where the school acts in place of the parents, uh, kind of takes that power away from the schools. Um, you know, and and the concern would be that, you know, how how badly do does every student need to be out there working at age fourteen or fifteen? How um, is that in their best interest socially? Are, is, are they going to be able to handle the work? Um, how are they achieving at school? Is this going to, you know, some people are going to be able to give a, a few extra hours and some are not. And um, I think that takes the school out of the loop. So I think the negative there is, you know, the school is is trying to do what's in the best interest of the student as well and work with the parents, and I think this would take them completely out of the loop. Uh, the good part is that takes the responsibility away from uh, the schools. Um, the bad part is we're, we're being held re responsible for uh, the student achievement and student attendance and, and all of those types of things. And if we don't have control over how late um, 
um, a 14 or 15 year old is going to work or how many hours they're going to work, um, it's going to make it more and more difficult for us to make sure that they're doing things appropriately in school within the school confines. So, uh, again, there's pros and cons there, and um, you know we'll, we'll support whichever. I uh, just uh, would hope that parents would remember that this is this is a big responsibility, and um, every student in the school is going to have to be held accountable for this. Now, the second part of that question had to do with the travel ball bill. Yeah, the the, the uh, travel ball bill again. This this is um, this is one that um, you know makes sense. There are uh, states um, around us that that are able to pull this off, and uh, and it doesn't seem like it's it's all that intrusive. Um, but I think jumping into it without thinking about you know some of the repercussions would be a mistake. And some of those repercussions may be, um, you know, this. You know, we had a we had a, a year this year where there was a lot of transfers that were going on, and uh, you know, I I can see this leading to even more transfers. Um, I think this is, you know, the the one thing that school athletics was designed for uh, was to help students get engaged in their school, was to help them uh, learn responsibility from people who are, you know, are trained in education, who have, who are trained to work with, with students. Um, and sometimes we forget that. Um, you know, so again, it comes down to, to load management. Um, and in specifics, you know, if you talk about baseball pitchers, um, you know, if, if I'm coaching a travel team and I have a kid on my travel team that that plays on your school baseball team, Rob, um, what if I decide that he he's my best pitcher? I'm going to pitch him on Saturday, and it doesn't matter that you have a big game coming up on Monday. Um, you know, I, I think that we need we're going to need to have some type of communication between um, you know school coaches and travel coaches in order for this to be in the best interest of the kids. Um, you know, I'm, again, I, I was a parent of three students who participated in, in athletics. They all had different aspirations after they, after they left high school. Um, and, you know, I can, I can see this being a benefit, but I can also see it being a hindrance depending on how it's handled. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ron, yep. let me ask. Let me ask a flip question of what uh, Rob just asked. Were there certain bills or certain legislative action that you had hoped to uh, to move through the session that did not? Um, you know, I think that's a I think that's a loaded question. I, I really um, was the only thing that that stood out to me were you know items. That addressed the school funding formula, which you know I'm I'm still hoping for some relief to come from that. Second, uh, last year we were charged with a, developing a discipline committee and and working with parents and our board to come up with some discipline ideas. And then you know there's new legislation to change things this year. Um, you know I I just hope that we're given the opportunity to see some things through instead of it just changing all the time. Okay, that was not meant to be a loaded question. I would not, I just, no, but, okay. I understand, I understand. And there, there, there are just so many on there that um, I, I don't think that there were any that I was hoping would get attention that didn't. Maria? So uh, this work bill sort of has prompted another question in my mind. I also heard another ad um, for a business not in West Virginia, just up over the border, Ron, um, in Pennsylvania, factory work, where they're saying, apply now, no GED, no high school diploma necessary. I know that, that the school system works very closely with the local business community, but that seems a little counterintuitive to, um, you know, try and have kids continue and graduate, um, 
I, and I don't think there's anything like that in the works here by any of the the local companies. Can you comment on that kind of um, measure? Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, you know that's that's just another it's just another thing that's out there that is uh, it it appears to fly in the face of of public school logic and you know it's just another competitor for our students attention and you know our goal should be to put forth the best um, students who are going to become the best citizens in our local communities um, as possible and you know we've guarded for decades probably close to 100 years of trying to keep you know that responsibility away from from students until they're aptly prepared with the social skills and the intellect and the, and the maturity and that's what the school system is has been based around for a number of years and we're going to have to start either um, changing that uh, approach or you know this this is something if if this work permit thing passes I can see more of that type of advertisements here in West Virginia um, you know that it would be cheaper uh, inexperienced laborers that that um, you know workforce out there is they're short workers I mean we're short workers so they're they're reducing their uh, their requirements and um, pulling in you know workers who are 14 15 16 that can that can uh, do this work I just think it's going to be a um, it's going to be Almost, it's not really a conflict, but it's just another uh, another thing that's in competition with public schools. You folks are like uh, a chef, Ron, and then we say you're going to make us a great meal. Here's the here's your cooks and the, here's your ingredients, and you've got no control over the cooks or the ingredients. Yeah, and sometimes I feel like okay, they they tell you that and you say okay, well, all right, well, here's what we can make with those ingredients, and it's going to take uh, you know. Uh, 30 minutes to bake all of that, and um, and then we're told, well, you've only got 15 minutes, and you don't have an oven, you've got a, uh, a grill. So, <laughs> you know, changing things on the fly is is you know what what has become the norm for us. And I just hope that anybody that is talking about any of these legislative um, measures, any of these bills, that they keep in mind what's best for the student. Uh, you know, I often I'm feeling like we're doing things to benefit parents, yep. and we're forgetting about the long-term effects on the students. Good point. Hey, uh, you have any shout-outs you want to do before we end our segment? Rob, Rob, you know that I have shout-outs, buddy. Mm -hmm. You know that they're coming. Um, you know, so uh, I first of all just want to say this is this is a big recognition week, our social worker week. Um, we've got maintenance appreciation day was this week and uh, I, I promised I'd give a shout out uh, to all of our maintenance workers who, who keep Berkeley County uh, schools up and running on a regular basis we recognized our um, um, our ace award winner for um, um, our professional positions in Berkeley County this week, and his name was Luke Sino. He's a fantastic teacher at Musselman Middle School. We have um, recognized 19 National Board certified uh, teachers. Um, 13 of them got their renewals, but we have six brand new ones, and uh, we continue to be one of the state's, uh, the state's leader in National Board certified teachers. I think that number gets us to 119 or 120. Uh, National Board Certified Teachers in Berkeley County, which is awesome. Um, this this month, um, you may hear or see um, safety presentations that are taking place in our elementary schools. There, it's a collaboration between our uh, law enforcement agencies. Our uh, pupil services department is pulling for pulling together that collaboration, and we're going to these elementary schools and talking about um, safety measures. Uh, what to do if you're approached by someone about drugs, what to do if there's a fire in the building, what to do if there's other emergencies. Um, so, you know, we've got law enforcement and fire and safety officials that are going to be in buildings, um, you know, over over the course of the month of March. So I think that's a great thing. I do want to remind everybody that on March the 20th, um, we will do our third community outreach session. 
uh, giving the community an opportunity to to ask questions. We will have uh, members of senior staff there, and uh, in the past we've had members of our school board um, who who are present at, at these meetings. March the 20th at Beddington Volunteer Fire Department at 530. Um, and I do want to give one last shout-out to Musselman High School, who was recently recognized as a West Virginia State Honor Jazz Band. So we got a lot of good things going on in Berkeley County, and I expect to keep that going. Ron, appreciate the time this morning. Thanks so much for yours. Uh, very much appreciated. Thank you, Ron. All right. Uh, you guys have a great day. You too. Surely will. And thanks to uh, Carla Trotman for uh, setting that up for us. Ron Stevens, Superintendent of Schools in Berkeley County at 902.